Uh, and there will be a question and answer mm. with the uh, co-author, and I think we'll bring it back and we'll tell for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you all so much for being here. This is just, I mean, overwhelming. I can't even believe how amazing this has been. Um, if we could get the people that are along the back, if you want to maybe come down on this side or find seats in there, because I bet more people are going to be coming in. That seems to be the trend. And then, so, so they'll have some space. You can come up here and sit on the floor. Um, but just kind of move yourself in. That would be great. Okay. So we are so wonderfully lucky to have Will Tuttle actually in our area now. Uh, he is Lake County, so he is very near us. Uh, he is an educator, a composer, a pianist, a writer, a peace activist, and vegan for over 30 years. Uh, he is the author of The World Peace Diet, a number one Amazon best-selling book. He's a recipient of the Courage of Conscious Award, holds a PhD from UC Berkeley focusing on educating intuition and altruism, has taught college courses on philosophy, humanities, uh, mythology, and comparative religions. He's a former Zen monk and Dharma master from the uh, Korean Zen tradition, and currently is conducting a music, art, and education ministry with his wife, Madeline, uh, who is also, he's also an artist, a visionary artist from Switzerland. Um, and Will's books and CDs are going to be available in the, he has a table in the main room uh, on, on, along the island in the middle to the right. And uh, please help me to welcome Will uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give a big hand to Hope. Hope, don't leave. Oh, yeah. keep going. Yes, you know. anyway. <laughs> uh, not just Hope, but really to the whole uh, group that in here in Sonoma that put this event on. First, year, first annual Sonoma County Veg Fest. Isn't it been great? Thank you. Awesome. Great. All right. So to me, this is a, a, a fabulous um, sign that we have uh, consciousness r rising in our society uh, right here in Northern California. I just returned from... Uh, a whirlwind tour to the uh, state of New York and New Jersey and, and southern Canada and it's great to see it happening you know everywhere in fact not too long before that uh, I was in uh, Australia New Zealand and Taiwan and the World Peace Diet has been translated now into 14 languages actually and so it's really getting out and uh, yeah so it's great to see the um, <clears throat> a slow awakening of human consciousness to uh, the devastating effects of animal agriculture on our physical health, on the environment, on, on our culture. Behind me here, as I'm talking, I just want to mention at the beginning, Madeline, my beautiful spouse, is in the back here. <laughs> Let's give a hand to Madeline, too. She's, um, she, uh, she just got back from Switzerland. She's also a longtime vegan, and she paints, uh, she, I guess you have like well, well over 20 prints of original watercolors that are basically designed to help us go deeper with our relationship with animals and nature. And so we have a few of those. And I think it's always helpful to remember that the animals themselves are, I think, are beseeching us to listen to the cries, uh, to be aware of the situation that we force them into. And so I'm hoping that the, the pigs and the cows and the sheep and the goats and the fishes and the other animals whose uh, lives are so severely uh, damaged by human uh, choices, really, and our behavior, uh, that somehow we can c reconnect with our natural compassion and wisdom and understanding and begin to hear the, the fact, really I think we know this in our bones, how many of you have, a have had at some point in your life a companion animal, like, some, like a dog or a cat? So you know these animals have interests and that their interests are to them as important to them as my interests are to me and yet these animals uh, that we use for food and other products, we don't care, we just say we don't care about their interests and we, so that has huge ramifications. Uh, not only for these poor animals, but for us, actually. So what I'd like to do, we, you know, the, the basic um, situation here for the next few minutes is that we have about 45 minutes or so uh, to discuss uh, what I think is the most important thing that we can be discussing, which is the ramifications of our food choices in our society today. And uh, there's really not nearly enough time for me to cover everything I'd like to cover, plus I'd like to leave a little time for, for questions as well. So you'll probably hear me speaking faster and faster as I go along here because <laughs> there's so much I want to share with you and 
there's just uh, nowhere near enough time. The World Peace Diet is uh, an audio book. It's 13 and a half hours long. And so I I, as a vegan, I don't like to cause unnecessary suffering to other sentient beings. And you won't have to st- sit in these hard chairs for a long time. But, um, but I would like to at least give a, a quick overview of what I think are the main ideas in the World Peace Diet. And then also maybe if we have time, I'm going to try to fit this in too. Talk a little bit about what I think are the keys to effective vegan advocacy. Because I think it's not only important that we really learn, make an effort to understand what veganism actually is and how we can thrive in our not yet vegan world as vegans, but also how we can be effective as vegan advocates. What are some of the keys to doing that as well? So basically, uh, the underlying idea is that all of us have been born into a society that has a hidden taboo subject we're not supposed to talk about ever or even think about. And we're in here talking about it and thinking about it. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you because if you found your way through the door here, uh, you really are, I believe, uh, some of the pioneers in our society today in terms of being willing to question the official stories of our society that are just destroying the natural world and really destroying ourselves at the same time. And it's in, in, in many ways, it, I think, uh, the fact is that we've been born into a society where we've been as a, <clears throat> forced to participate in routine rituals that basically crush our natural wisdom and compassion. And so what we're seeing, I think, with you people and, and happening more and more is the resurrection uh, of our capacities to uh, understand at a deep level the truth of our own tr- true nature and of our relationship, not only with each other and with non-human animals, but with nature and, and uh, this beautiful earth. How, have you noticed how beautiful the earth is? Living up here, it's not that hard to notice, but it's so beautiful. And nature is so abundant. And the, the basic underlying idea, really, in, in everything I'm saying, is that we live on such a beautiful, abundant earth that we could easily feed everyone on a fraction of the land if we would get away from animal agriculture and we could stop the incredible, just mind-numbing cruelty and abuse that animals have to go through and that wildlife has to go through and that hungry people have to go through and this whole web of suffering that, it, that animal agriculture causes. So the, another underlying idea is that anthropologists understand that the, any culture's meals are that culture's primary way of indoctrinating <laughs> the people who are born into that society. In other words, indoctrination isn't a bad thing. It just happens. Wherever we're born, we're born into a culture. We learn you know, our language, our, our attitudes, our belief system, and all of that is determined really by the culture that we're born into. So if we as individuals want to live a life of meaning and authenticity uh, where we're actually somehow bringing forth the um, uh, capacities that we have in a meaningful way so that our time on this planet is not just in a sense uh, frittered away working for large-scale corporations and financial institutions, but we're actually doing something to bring our gifts to the world, then we have to make an effort to understand ourselves. Who are we? What are we? What is our purpose on this planet? And if we're serious about making that inquiry, then we have to look into the cultural program of whatever culture we're born into. And if if we're serious about that, then we have to, we're called really at a very deep level to look into the culture's food system. Because the food rituals are the primary way that any society passes its values from generation to generation. The underlying attitudes and norms and values and mores of any society are embedded in the meals. And so these are the, these are the most powerful rituals in any society. Are the, when we get together two or three times a day and share food together, that's the most powerful ritual in any society where we transmit the values from generation to generation. So this is the greatest adventure, really, of self-discovery we can go on, is to make an effort to understand the ramifications of our culture's food system. And when we start to look at it, And most people don't want to look at this because it's very uncomfortable. It's very disturbing, really, to us as beings who care about fairness and justice, uh, who don't get up in the morning thinking, well, how can I cause the most cruelty and violence I possibly can? (laughs) We don't get up in the morning thinking that, right? We want to basically get up in the morning thinking, I want to to bless the world. I want to create opportunities for being creative and, uh, and having a beautiful day and sharing that with other people. But we're born into a society where... The, the main activity of our culture is herding animals. We don't realize that. We are born into a herding culture. That's hard to see it, but if someone came from outer space and landed here and spent a few days perhaps looking around, and what, what are they doing down there on that planet Earth down there? They would radio back up to the mothership 
and they would say, well, what they're doing, they're basically what these what they're doing is this, this, so these one race, the one species, these, these humans, they're basically just killing and eating a lot of animals. We don't think of ourselves as doing that. We think, well, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a computer programmer, I'm a teacher, whatever. But if you go into any house or any building anywhere, you'll find people, you'll find the bodies and secretions of tortured animals, and you'll find people eating it, and the, and the main rituals we're engaged in, and it's the main activity we're involved in. So the underlying fact that we cannot um, really deny, I mean, this is, this is a conservative estimate, is that in the United States, uh, every single day, we're killing 75 million animals for food. That, that happens every day. That's the ongoing reality of the society we're born into, is that every single day, and there's no big headline in the New York Times saying, oh my gosh, what happened yesterday? 75 million animals were killed. Some kind of terrible catastrophe has befallen us. Just, you know, 75 million animals were killed. There's no, it's business as usual. It's just routine and relentless. And the good news in this, even though it's, it's, it's the, the implications of this are actually devastating uh, to us. We don't, I don't think we realize how devastating they actually are. But the good news is that this is happening for one reason, essentially, which is that we, the people, are taking out our, our, our wallets and we're voting for it, right? This is the vote. When you take out a wallet and you put out your money, that's a vote that gets counted <laughs> by the, where it really counts. You know, I don't know about the other votes, if they ever get counted, <laughs> but <laughs> these votes get counted. So we have to understand that, that this is happening, we're doing it. And so it's not some governmental program, like some war in a foreign country that we can't stop it. It's just like they're just doing it. We're, we're doing this ourselves. And so we as people, as individuals, are empowered. And I think this is about empowerment. We are empowered to question this. We're empowered to question the official stories that inject this behavior into us to participate in this. We're empowered to move our lives in so that we're living our lives in harmony and in alignment with our values. And we're also empowered to spread this message to our friends and colleagues and neighbors and family members and so forth in a, in a way that's hopefully effective. So the basic, yeah, everybody turn off your cell phones. <laughs> so the basic idea is um, this is this is an activity that we're causing. So I want to just talk briefly. I'm going to try to do this just in a few minutes uh, about the ramifications of this industrialized killing machine. Because what I've discovered in the research I've been doing uh, for many years is that this is devastating on every level. In other words, environmentally, I'll, t I'll talk about it on the outer level first briefly, and then about the inner level because this is this industrialized this activity of killing so many animals is devastating to the outer world, but also to the inner world. And there's a lot of books and articles that have been written about the effects of this on the outer world. And not many have been written about the effects of this on the inner landscape of our own emotional and psychological and spiritual lives. And I do want to talk about that a little bit too. That's one of the main messages in the World Peace Diet. But in the outer world, again, just briefly, killing this many animals, basically we've created an industrialized killing machine that has tentacles that are vast. They reach everywhere. There's, I don't think there's really any place hardly on this entire planet that is not directly affected by animal agriculture. This machine reaches its tentacles to the bottoms of every ocean, to the heart of the rainforest, everywhere on land, basically, and into every institution in our society. And so, in everything it touches, unfortunately, it's, it's toxic, it's devastating, it's poisonous, uh, it's traumatic. It's traumatic to whatever it touches, Incl not only to the, um, to, to the animals who are imprisoned in these stinking sheds where they never see the light of day, but they have to be fed. And wildlife has to be killed. Habitat has to, habitat has to be destroyed. Uh, fish have to be caught. And so uh, so it's, it's a war against nature. And, 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 and the irony of it is that in many ways when we eat this stuff and feed it to our children, we're finding that it's actually traumatic on that level to us as well. And so... Uh, environmentally, it's, uh, we, it's really the underlying driving force behind monocropping, which is growing huge areas of land where we just grow basically genetically engineered corn and soy, which are fed not to people, but primarily to, uh, to, to imprison animals. And so there's the huge amount of soil erosion, of air pollution, of water pollution. One large animal agriculture operation will create more sewage than the entire New York City. You know, and it's unregulated and it's far more toxic than human waste. So this is running into the oceans. It's causing large dead zones. I was just reading the other day, there's over 450 dead zones in the oceans today. The largest one is off the uh, Mississippi River where it goes into the Gulf of Mexico. Gigantic dead zone where everything is killed because of what's called a hypoxia, which is basically the so-called nutrient-rich runoff 
of chemical fertilizers as well as pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides running into the water and animals cannot survive in the oceans anymore. So basically, this is the greatest attack against uh, the integrity of our ecosystems because the underlying truth that we, again, we can't avoid in this whole thing is that animal agriculture is very inefficient. So you take, we grow huge amounts of grain and yet instead of eating that directly, we feed it to these animals and animals convert this grain and legumes like soy and other, and alfalfa actually, legumes. They convert this to saturated fat, cholesterol, acidifying animal protein and huge amounts of sewage and also a lot of nitrous oxide and uh, methane. What are nitrous oxide and methane? Anybody know about those? What do they contribute to? Right. They're very powerful, uh, much more powerful than carbon dioxide in, in uh, contributing to, to the climate destabilization, which is happening everywhere. So, and then in addition to that, just briefly, we see the cutting down of rainforest uh, right now in the Amazon over an acre per second. I just read a re just the most recent study actually came out and, uh, about two months ago. And again, the driving force behind cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon is people taking out their wallets and saying, I want to buy meat, dairy products, and eggs and paying for that. And so when that happens, uh, we're not just, when we cut down acres of rainforest, we're not just cutting down a few trees. It's not like it's a, a forest, like a tree farm. It's, these are incredibly beautiful, not only beautiful, but um, rich ecosystems that took millions of years to evolve. And we're just attacking them, cutting down and destroying the lungs of the earth, as well as causing the mass extinction of other species. We're right now in the middle of what is referred to um, by biologists as, as the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. It's driven by, again, one activity, people eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, cutting down rainforests, destroying habitat, cutting down regular forests, and then also plundering the oceans. And that's a whole other thing that I don't have time to, talk, to go into, really. But, but animal agriculture is enormously devastating to the oceans. We're overfishing the oceans to such a degree that every year the amount of fish we catch, even though our capacity increases, the amount of fish we catch decreases because they're gone. And so now two-thirds of the fish we're eating in the United States, for example, are factory farmed fish uh, operations, which are extremely toxic and very wasteful, and uh, also causing the, the devastation of coral reefs and uh, and basically the, the loss of life in the ocean. I was just reading the other day, again, a, an article by one of the foremost oceanographers in the world, and she was saying that the o large areas of the oceans, the fish populations are gone. The large fish populations, a lot of the larger fish like tuna and swordfish and, and salmon and a lot of many others uh, are down to 5 or 10 percent of their, what, how many there, there have been uh, traditionally uh, living. And so jellyfish are taking over large areas of the ocean. So we're, the, the demand for fish is almost infinite because we're not just catching fish for human consumption, we're also catching them to feed to animals because uh, animal agriculture scientists discovered a long time ago that if you enrich the feed of these animals that you're eating or, or whose dairy products you're consuming, um, it's profitable, right? So you have the fact that dairy cows and cows in general uh, in the United States uh, are eating more fish than humans are. They're eating, we're, they're eating huge amounts of fish ground up as fish meal to boost their production of dairy products and to fatten them up in feedlots. So uh, this causes these poor animals to become sick because if they're eating grass, that's what they're designed for, but we don't just feed them grass, we feed them grain, which is already very hard on them. It causes E. coli and a lot of other problems, but we don't just stop there. <laughs> we're feeding them fish meal and then we're feeding them a lot of other stuff like uh, chicken meal and, and um, chicken litter and uh, other uh, byproducts of slaughterhouses as well as, uh, very unsavory th to think about, but as well as uh, d dogs and cats, of course, that are euthanized or ground up, roadkills euthanized. All this stuff is all ground up. It ends up being fed to these animals. It concentrates in the flesh and secretions of the animals, especially in dairy products. All the radioactivity, which is really spreading, unfortunately, ends up in the fish. Uh, the, all, in all the fish meal fed to the dairy cows, ends up concentrating the breast milk. We find dairy, for example, is the leading cause of breast cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, it's very unwise to be eating this stuff because it concentrates toxins enormously, but it's also a war against the natural world. It's by far the worst thing we're doing to the earth in terms of destroying the ecosystems of the earth is eating meat, dairy products, and eggs. There's, for, as far as global climate change, species extinction, the loss of genetic diversity, um, the environmental pollution on every level, <coughs> Animal agriculture trumps everything by far. You don't read about it so much in the media because the, media, the biggest advertisers in the media are the large uh, chemical and agriculture and fast food companies. 
spent millions of dollars, and my father actually owned a chain of newspapers when I was growing up, and I learned as a little kid growing up that, you know, when you own the newspaper, you don't, run, you don't write articles against your advertisers. You know? <laughs> they don't like that. They pull the ads out. Well, that's what's happening. So we don't hear about this. We have to, the only way we hear about this is if we come together in one of these rooms and we talk about it like this, you know? <laughs> so this is what we're doing. They come to this kind of this hidden grassroots meeting, and you gotta come to a veg fest somewhere. Uh, it's, we, it's, it's like this, you know, it's a grassroots self-education effort, basically. We have to t talk about it, share these ideas with each other, and then also on the internet and maybe with your, you know, friends and family. But that's really the key, is to see that we can create a world of abundance and health for everyone, but we have to question the official stories of our society, like they have to eat meat to get enough protein, or have to have dairy products to get enough calcium. There's no truth to these at all. In fact, it's just the opposite, that animal agriculture and animal proteins are actually much harder for the body to assimilate than plant-based proteins, and the same thing with calcium. There's no study ever that's shown that, that dairy products are somehow good for your bones. In fact, there's been many studies showing that dairy products actually contribute to worse bone health, and the if you plot any graph, the, the higher the dairy consumption, the, wor the worse the cases of uh, osteoporosis and other things. So anyway, the idea is to question these underlying um, stories. And the other thing I just want to mention is, uh, in terms of wildlife, the fact that uh, animal agriculture is so uh, devastating, especially lately, and this is true around here too, I think somewhat, uh, with this, with this uh, arising of the so-called happy meat and free range and grass-fed movement, that's actually increased the violence towards animals. Because when you have all the animals, I mean, t typically 100% of all the animals people were eating were in factory farms or in enclosed in these feedlots where nobody can get to them. I mean, I couldn't get in there. You know, <laughs> they're locked. No one gets in. No coyote's ever going to get in there or, or any fox or any bear or anybody else. But as soon as we have now more, some more animals living inside these electrified fences and make, raising, you know, being sold at Whole Foods and other places for a premium because they're supposedly grass-fed and this and that, now we have an, a big increase in the killing of, uh, you know, this, we have this um, department, it's, it sounds good, it's called the Department of Wildlife Services. It's part of the Department of Agriculture. They spend millions of our taxpayer dollars killing millions of animals. They're killing everything out there. I mean, you know, they're killing coyotes and foxes and wolves and bobcats and bears and prairie dogs and skunks and raccoons and otters and trumpeter swans and cormorants and pigeons and I mean whatever it is they don't want them out there they, they it's this is this is supposed to you know ranchers and, and these farmers they just they they want just their sheep and goats and pigs and chickens so we have to remember that, that, that this, this kind of stuff is really a war against, uh, against wildlife and against the health, the health of our planet. And again, come back to the idea that we could feed everyone on a fraction of the land, that we can grow food organically, we can grow food veganically. So I re really recommend all of, all of us, really, in, in looking at this, to move toward a plant-based diet in terms of environmental sustainability. If you want to just shrink our eco footprint, there's no greater, more powerful action anyone can do than to move toward a plant-based diet. You know, it's like 20 to thir or 30 to 1. In other words, 20, like, according to the United Nations, 32 um, vegans, people eating a plant-based diet, use as much water, fresh water, which is becoming basically like oil, you know, it's really important, really precious, um, as one person eating a standard Western diet. You know, 32 to 1. Think how this, this is, it's, it's shocking, it's terrible that we're using so much water, but the good news is implicit in all this is that we can radically reduce the, the, the pressure that we're exerting on ecosystems, on water, on land, on p petroleum. It's about 15 or 20 to 1. And these are very conservative estimates. Some people say it's more like 60 or 70 to 1, but you know, we'll say, okay, 15 or 20. It's still huge. So reducing our, uh, and, and eliminating would be the, the greatest thing we can do to move to a uh, plant-based diet. I would also, just while I'm at it here, I would uh, I'll also recommend organically grown, because if it's not organic, you know, all these, all these chemical uh, preservatives and, and um, well, not preservatives, but um, fertilizers and pesticides are damaging to fish and birds and bees and wildlife and butterflies. So I think organic is really helpful. And then I would go beyond that to unprocessed foods or whole foods as much as possible uh, because the chemical preservatives and so forth that are in foods are not healthy for us. So that's the environmental side. The cultural side, briefly, just uh, to touch on this, uh, basically eating animal agriculture I mean, eating animal foods and animal agriculture in general is devastating not just to the natural ecosystems, but also to our society. And again, it's hard to figure out, why is it bad for our society? Well, basically, we have a lot of war. We have a lot of conflict. And uh, we have a lot of 
uh, social uh, unrest and injustice in our society. I think that's well known. We have a lot of inequality. And if you look at animal agriculture, it exacerbates this enormously. It's be, number one because it's so wasteful. In other words, we understand, no one argues this. Every year we grow enough food to feed between 12 and 15 billion people. We only have how many? Seven, what? 7.2, 7.3 billion people. And yet, and every year, about a billion people are starving to death because we're feeding most of the grain we're growing. Instead of feeding it to people who are hungry, we're feeding it to animals who are imprisoned, then eating the flesh of these animals. And so we have a situation where about a billion, between one and two billion people, uh, of our brothers and sisters are chronically hungry and starving, cannot get enough to eat, have diarrhea, and, and just malnourished. And then, again, on the other side of the spectrum, the people who are eating diets very high in animal-based foods, um, ironically, uh, are suffering also from the diseases that come from eating huge amounts of grain and legumes that indirectly had been converted into saturated fat, cholesterol, acidifying animal protein, and getting the diseases that come from doing that, which are the diseases that are epidemic really in our society today, such as breast, as I said, breast, prostate, and colon cancer, strokes, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, uh, liver and kidney disease, autoimmune diseases, uh, dementia and, and th those kinds of things. So uh, arthritis, all of these things are linked very definitively to our eating diets rich in animal foods. And it's important to remember also that it's basically for the most part people who are living in more industrialized nations of the world who have relatively more high powered economies where it's not difficult for us to drive up the price of grain in the world markets to feed to our imprisoned pigs and cows and chickens and fishes and eat their, the products that come from that. And, but we are pushing people off the land in less industrialized nations and they don't have high powered economies and so they are basically uh, suffering hunger and malnourishment. And that engine, that, that basic inequity where you have some people who see their little kids starving in their arms and cannot get a, enough to eat, while over here people not far away basically in the same planet and very often in the same country uh, or nearby are, are eating so high off the hog, you know, taking all this land, all this petroleum, all this food, eating and then eating meat and dairy and, and that kind of inequity is, gonna, is the engine that causes war. We cannot have peace without justice and that kind of inequity I think we have to understand really drives the war machine at a very deep level. Uh, besides that animal agriculture is traumatic. It's trauma uh, the animals are traumatized and the workers are also traumatized. We have whole armies of our brothers and sisters that have to do the work of, of electroshocking and uh, stabbing and killing these animals. And so these workers have the highest rates of suicide and drug addiction, and alcoholism and spousal abuse and very often they go back into their communities and commit trauma and they themselves suffer what, from what is referred to as perpetrator induced traumatic stress disorder which is just work, doing work that brings out the worst in them. And so if I go into, go into a store and I buy something that's just kind of wrapped up in cellophane and saran wrap and styrofoam and it looks like just a you know, piece of flesh. I do not know what the animal went through who suffered to have their flesh in that wrapped up like that or the worker who did that. In fact, uh, but there's no, we're not taught to look at this. You know, I mean, we're, we're not taught to question this in any way. In fact, if I go to a restaurant and I order prime rib, then uh, the wait person very often might say, if it's a high class restaurant, they'll say, oh, good choice, sir. You're a very wise, discriminating buyer. The prime rib is excellent. Good idea. Now, the wait person doesn't say, you barbarian, don't you know what you're doing? You're ordering something. People are going to stab animals. It's going to destroy the ecosystem. There's all this suffering. And you're just going to do it for what? Just because it tastes good or just because you're programmed like a hypnotized robot to eat something that's not even good for you? You, know, you, know, <laughs> you don't hear that. <laughs> They'd get fired right away if they tried to say that. So, so the, we have to realize that we're in a system, essentially. There's this great saying, I think, by Krishnamurti. Uh, he said, it is not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. You know, and that's really important to, you know, remember that. It's not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So in many ways, this is the situation we find ourselves in. You know, we're, we're, in, we're in a system where some, something in us, I think it's our natural wisdom and, and awareness and compassion and intelligence, starts to awaken, and yet we're in a system that 
doesn't want it to awaken. Because <laughs> if I start awakening, people are going to get, you know, my doctor's going to criticize me or tell me or my friends or my family or the co-workers. Because we want to fit in. We want to go to the church barbecue and eat where everybody's eating. We want to go to the company picnic and the boss is eating a piece of chicken. And we say, oh, ye, you know, if I'm not eating the chicken, he's going, well, what's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> You're not going to get a raise. The heck with you, you know? You're a vegan? Oh, get out of here. <laughs> so we want, we want to get a raise. You know, we want to fit in. It's kind of like a birth, actually. I was thinking about this the other day, you know? It's kind of like a birth. You know, like, for example, when we're, before we're born, everything is great, right? I'm, there I am in, in the, my mother's womb. It's nice and warm and cozy. I'm never hungry. I'm never thirsty. I just hang out. I'm all safe. I'm protected. I don't have to impress anybody. I don't have any social relationships I have to deal with. It's just great, you know? You just, everything's nice. I'm just in the womb. Ah, oh, I love being in the womb. Yeah, it's great. And then, but then something happens, you know, the, the, some kind of pressure starts building and I start getting squeezed. It's like, oh no, what's happening? Oh my God, everything's, and then, and then I just start getting pushed through this like little, oh my God, I got to go through there. You know, it's like, ah, and then, you know, and then my, everything gets, it gets really traumatic and, I, and, then I, and then I get pushed out and then I, and then here, and then I end up in this whole other world, right? I'm born. And yet, but everybody cheers. Oh, woo-hoo, you know, here, you he know, got a boy, got a girl, whatever. You know, and so everybody's clapping. It's great, you know. And, and we look at that and we think, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, right? I mean, you have a whole new life ahead of you. You can't stay, you don't want to stay in the womb your whole life. You want to get born and, and live a life, you know. It's the same thing with going vegan, actually. You know, before, like as a pre-vegan, actually, uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, right? There's vegans and pre-vegans. Because sooner or later, <laughs> everybody's going to go vegan in this life or the next. I mean, sometime. So if we're a pre-vegan, you know, if we're, it, it, life in the, it's like being in the womb, right? Here I am, I'm in the womb. Ah, I'm, ah, I, there's McDonald's, yum, yum, yum. There's Burger King, yum, yum, yum. There's Peggy Fried Chicken, yum, yum. Oh, life is good. Food is good. And yeah, everything's great. I'm just fitting in with society. Everything's good. But then something happens. And we start getting the same thing. We start getting pressured. <laughs> you know, maybe our conscience, maybe, the, maybe our health, something. We start to hear and, we, and we, we start getting pressured into moving in a new direction. And, we, and if, if all things, I think, unfold for us and we actually get born and we become a vegan, it's a little different. I think when someone goes vegan, actually, I think you may not hear everybody cheer, but I think all the angels in heaven start cheering. Yay, we got a vegan. <laughs> I think it really does happen. <laughs> Woo-hoo. But it may not happen down here. You might say, I'm a vegan. They go, well, you're a vegan. Well, you know, I don't care. You know, what's, what's good about that? You know, people start criticizing you. But I think that it, it's similar because when we do go vegan, those of you who have done this, I think you can resonate with this on some level. It's, it's like we do have a new life. I mean, it's a, new, it's a whole new opportunity to actually to live our life, it, that we are now in a position where we've qu- we're questioning the official stories in our society. And that's the hard part. You know, it's like when I'm in the mood, womb, I don't question it. I'm just here, everything. I'm kind of naive. I'm gullible. I just believe whatever they tell me. You know, I just think everything's good. I live in America. I steak and apple pie. Everything's great. <laughs> Once we begin to question that, and we see this incredible ocean of violence and, and abuse and the insanity of the system, it's, it takes a lot of character to kind of, imb- to, to kind of get our minds around that and see it and then to actually stand up against it and actually say, I'm not going to pay for that and talk about this. I mean, it really, in a sense, forces us into a new birth where we live a whole new life. And that's, I think, the most benevolent thing any human being can do is to come to this planet, go through this vicious programming uh, of being forced from the time of little infants to eat the flesh and secretions of tortured animals and somehow get that, that whole program injected into us and then be able to question it and then begin to actually be able to be a force for the healing of our world, to question that. Because it's like Gandhi said, you know, he said, there can never be any positive social transformation without positive personal transformation. It really starts with us, and we have to actually do it. And once we actually do that, and we're born, in a sense, again, <laughs> and we've, we're able to understand that our culture's routine mistreatment of animals for food, primarily, and, and other products, is the fundamental wound that in, in, is injected into us at a very deep level by our entire culture and that we can heal that wound by, uh, I think it, it does take some kind of spiritual practice, whatever that is, some kind of inner uh, questioning, inner looking, inner um, quieting of, our, of the program that's always blasting in our heads and realizing that what we are essentially 
It's not just a physical thing. See, we're raised in a society that teaches us that everything is matter, right? I mean, a piece of, you know, I'm, you're just eating a piece of meat, right? This is a, an animal, a pig, you know, pigs and cows and chickens are just sold like sacks of cement. And the underlying message at a very deep level is materialism, that this is all there is. And, you don't, and, and we begin to teach other, treat other people that way. You know, we're taught as little boys to look at little, you know, other girls as, as pieces of meat to be used. And we, we're, taught, we're raised in a, a, a capitalist society where essentially we have to market ourselves as a piece of meat, as an image, as an object in the, in the market. And we, tr we learn to manipulate others in the same way. This is all based on animal agriculture, on, on reducing beings. So what, what I talk about in the World Peace Diet, what I'll just share here now, again, I don't really have time to go into it as much as I'd like to, but basically the idea that this, this uh, animal agriculture and, and eating animal foods as a, as a foundation for our society is not only devastating to the outer world, like uh, our environment and our culture, but to the inner landscape. Because all of us are forced, basically just by virtue of being born and raised here, to embrace a certain mentality that is not in our best interest at all. But we embrace it because it's, forced, it's injected into us. Uh, just by growing up here and, and eating these meals. Like, for example, a mentality of reductionism. We're, we're taught early on to look and s develop a way of seeing where we see a being, instead of seeing a being, we see a thing, right? We see a pig, it's not a pig, it's a piece of meat. It would be very rare, for example, for someone on, uh, at breakfast some morning, uh, while they're eating bacon or sausage together, to say, hmm, I wonder what she was like. What do you mean what she was like? You're just eating a piece of meat. No, but, but, you know, it's a pig. I mean, I wonder, what she, I wonder what she was like, what her, you know, how she looked and what her feelings were. That would be such a subversive activity. <laughs> Don't ever do that. Don't think that. So we're taught to, to disconnect. We're taught basically a mentality of reductionism, of the commodification of life. We don't see a being, we see a commodity that you buy and sell. It's a mentality also of disconnectedness of just not making the connection between what's on our plate and what it took to get it on our plate. And intelligence is the capacity to make connections. So our, the, in, the inherent intelligence of, of the individuals of our society and our society is profoundly reduced by forcing everybody to disconnect three times a day and stay shallow and not go deep and not look deeply and just stay on the surface and just pretend that we don't know. We don't know anything. I don't know anything. I just believe whatever the authorities tell me because that's what I do with every meal. I don't look deeply. I don't see what's actually there. I learn to become blind. I learn to become deaf to the cries of these animals. I learn to just go along and reduce my capacities. And I'm willing to, to justify and support corporations as they devastate the ecosystems and not question anything and allow corporations to create a police state and not question anything. We have to really see animal agriculture as the fundamental dumbing down action and ritual in our society not only devastating to the outer world, but to our inner world. It disconnects us from the reality of our life and what we're doing and how we're living and the relationships that we're in with other living beings who value their lives as much as we value our lives and who have a right, as much of a right to a life of, of, um, where they can express themselves as we do. So this is the underlying mentality that's injected into us. It's also a mentality of exclusion and of predation. And we, you know, we create these predatory systems where the strong take, dominate the weak. It's a, essentially a mentality of privilege and elitism. The subtext of every meal is that certain beings are inherently superior and it's fine for the inherently inferior beings to be abused and killed for the inherently superior beings. So this whole mentality of entitlement uh, of privilege and elitism, which again is rampant in our society where you have the so-called 1%, you know, this, this, this privileged privilege wealthy elite that's controlling everything and other people that don't have enough to get by. Again, every meal is essentially injecting into everyone in our society. This is fine. This is the way it is. And the other thing that's really a major part of this is that every, every uh, meal is a ritual uh, suppression of the sacred feminine. You have to understand that animal agriculture from the very beginning was not just about, mi about people dominating animals. It was about men dominating female animals, and not just dominating female animals. It was about men dominating the uteruses and mammary glands of female animals and the reproductive organs, reproductive cycles of female animals. That's what it was about. And so the whole society, I, I go into this in the World Peace Diet, and if I had another hour, you know, I could tell you about it. But it's amazing to realize this, that, that when people started owning animals as property for food, and it was in Iraq, you know, 10,000 years ago, it was wild sheep and wild goats, and then later wild cows, and then other animals gradually added. It was, it was a very gradual revolution, but it was a revolution of reductionism and of reducing female animals and of men dominating female animals. 
and you couldn't have animal agriculture today without it. And so what happened in this revolution was this arising of a wealthy elite class who owned most of the wealth. Wealth was animals, the very first word for, for uh, capita, you know, the word capita in Latin, which we get our word for wealth and capitalism, uh, it means head, is in head of livestock. So the, the first capitalists that emerged were the wealthy sh sheep owners and cow owners and so forth that owned the land. And then they invented two more institutions back then, uh, many thousands of years ago, which we still have with us today. The first one is uh, the institution that we, that, of war. Uh, of, they would see somebody else that had a lot of cattle and sheep and goats and they would go attack, this big attack. Whoever lost the war, uh, you didn't want to lose a war back then because if you lost the war, not only did the, all the livestock become the property of the victor, so it was the first get-rich-quick scheme and they got very wealthy all of a sudden. They had all this, a lot more wealth, uh, livestock, but the people became slaves, so they invented slavery. So the very first word for war on this planet that we know of is the ancient Sanskrit word gavya. It means the desire for more cows. That's the first word for war. And they would go on these wars and w women would be, uh, become slaves and would be just impregnated against their will, just like they did the animals, to create more slaves so they'd be more wealthy. The more slaves you had, the more wealth you had. And the men would be castrated to make them docile like they did to the male animals so they could work in the fields and so forth. So this very bellicose culture emerged based on a wealthy elite owning animals. They were the ones that ate most of the meat and dairy. And uh, based on war and slavery and the domination of female animals, and this whole culture spread basically from the uh, Eastern Mediterranean to the Northern Mediterranean to Central Asia to Europe, came over here to the Americas. It's been spreading uh, all over to Africa, Asia. It's still spreading today through ConAgra and Cargill and Monsanto and Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, the World Bank, the IMF, the whole, I call it the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's vast complex. And, you know, we have to... <laughs> so, we have to understand that the most su beneficial and sub positively <coughs> subversive action anyone can take in this, in this culture is to question that and say, I'm not going to take out my wallet and pay t someone to torture and kill animals. That, that is questioning this whole thing at the deepest level. And at the same time, what I love about this is that we're creating a new world. Because like Bob <coughs> Mr. Fuller said, you know, he said, it's not a good idea really to just fight and attack a corrupt, evil, obsolete system. You'll just, you'll just have a big headache. You know, just like. But what we do is we just create, a new, create something else. And that's why I love veganism in a sense, is that we're creating an alternative. Um, what, what we're talking about is supporting businesses and a way of life that's based on equality, sustainability, on freedom, on justice, on uh, right livelihood, on just using uh, a much um, smaller amount of resources, treating everyone, humans and non-humans alike, with kindness and compassion, creating the possibility for wildlife to, to live there, for animals to live their lives and celebrate their lives on this planet. And, we could, and the beauty is it's doable. And I think as we wake up, we can b begin moving in that direction more and more. So, that's, uh, I think, all I really have time to, to say here. I, I'd love to say a little bit more. Maybe I'll just close with maybe...